I'm Hulud. I'm an artist. Uh, my area of interest is uh, sculpture. Um, and how the light affect the shape and uh, how the relationship between shadow and space and the light in sculpture art. Mm, good. This is it. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, no. Okay. Yes, you uh, I'm Sally, I've just completed my MA in Fine Art, um, so my current area of interest at the moment is forms, character counts, that kind of thing. But you, you do it in what way? You show it in what way? No. Being a bit facetious about, you know, the yeah. application process. I'm a painter, that's yeah, my... painter, there we go. Got that keyword out. And specifically looking at pattern, repetition, structure of interiors really <coughs> yeah. so I think that it would have some resonance with Chris in terms of how she's been playing around with questions of the inside outside because a lot of yeah, yours, yeah. your work is inside outside questions I found that really quite striking last week actually was just how much overlap there is and how everyone is pursuing such different different areas there there are so many areas of yeah. overlap really interesting great thank you Hi everybody, I'm Jo, um, I'm an artist, um, I'm also a teacher of art, and um, my practice is involved with photography, um, and my area of research is looking at whether an art object can, can teach, and what things, or can things have pedagogical value. And when you say an, an object can teach, do you mean that the object embodies some form of experience that it can then impart, or do you mean something else? Um, that's not a question of what, that's sort of a question I have sort of thought of. It's In the dark, dark ages. <laughs> no, I, I'm just wondering how does an object actually teach? I mean, do you literally, how old are your, your kids at your? Uh, students are 11 backwards. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have like an object that you show them, like for example, the London Pigeon mug. Okay, um, do, would you show that nothing? Doesn't look like a London Pigeon. It's got two legs. <laughs> she <laughs> actually has one <laughs> leg. It has <laughs> one leg. Right. Yeah, it is a London Pigeon. <laughs> it's a little clean. That's it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not yeah. sure about the iridescent green neck. Yeah, that's right. Anyway. Actually, this is kind of all happens by accident because um, uh, students are really fidgety and you can really like wind yourself up telling them not to fidget but actually if you let them fidget it's quite interesting so I usually ha used to have lots of things that aren't really related to any of my lessons you know about on my desk and stuff and they grab them and look at them and turn around and Oh, let's really think about this curious. table here, and you see my feeling, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> the fidgety students that need to do yeah, something. So yeah, so it's quite, it's sort of come out of that hmm. process of putting things in front of them and, and what happens to those things. Hmm. Kine sure. Kinesthetic learning, right? That's well, interesting. Well, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I've got to teach that tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is. And what actually, do you mean by kinesthetic? Well, this it, Howard Gardner came up with these theories of multiple intelligences, mm. which I have to teach about tomorrow. But um, it's it's sort of useful to apply to students in a school environment, but I don't really see how it works for them, you know, in the rest of their lives. It really separates life and school. Mm. You know, Nature, um, the journal Nature, uh, came out with a uh, an article last year on the fact that plants have the faculty of smell. Um, that it's not that they just smell, but they actually can smell things, and uh, and they are calling it a plant intelligence, mm -hmm. and that the way in which it operates is that the plant doesn't actually have a brain as such as we know, um, but that the olfactory version, like the nose of the plant kind of thing, picks up uh, when there is danger. So if there's a fungus that's attacked a neighboring plant, okay. it can produce like antibodies, as it were, or anyway, bad smells to ward off the fungus. And that's why when there's a viral attack of the trees, like the elm trees, they couldn't get the message out fast enough. But when there have been the chestnut tree problem, uh, 
the chestnut trees were able to get the message out to other tr chestnut trees. And it, it's a fascinating, I'll bring it in so that I'll, I'll, free, I'll try to I'll okay. scan it and send it around because it's, it's just amazing because I've always loved uh, those plants that eat animals. I've always found that that's just so incredible to me. What's that? They call them the shichka. They call them the what? The shichka. That's like a little green plant. That's true. Oh, right. The Venus flytrap. The Venus flytrap, right. Not the shichka. We have them at home. But they are also one that is in Scotland that eats sheep. I thought it was quite impressive. What? <laughs> yeah. 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 Stop angry farmer. <laughs> Don't tell me they, they deep fry. <laughs> and then they eat it for the blood, blood pudding. Yeah, right. perfect. They can't have a plant eat sheep. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm going to get that article and I'll show it to you. Okay. Yes, eat, Google it. There's sheep probably. eating plant. <laughs> he eats the whole thing. I mean, the whole animal. Oh, it like or it just sort of leaves. feeds on its flesh, like well, kind of like a. Good enough, you think? Not in one go. <laughs> What's that? Not in one go. Not in one go. No, it's not like a crocodile plant. Okay. <laughs> so does it live on the sheep? It doesn't live on the sheep. It traps the sheep. Okay. And then it eats it. Mm -hmm. Sucks it. Sucks it dry. Rest well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there's something. There's something on YouTube. Something on YouTube. Something on YouTube. <laughs> Must be true. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm not wasting our time listening to you. Oh, it's Poignancy. I'm totally obsessed with plants that do weird things. Smelling, eating. If a dog went past, it wouldn't be interesting. No, it might eat a dog as well. I mean, I only found it because it was eating the sheep, because nobody could figure out what was happening to the sheep. And they, th they, and they realized that a plant was eating it. Would it eat people? It might. <laughs> you know, so we can do it. Anyway. Okay. Hello, I'm um, Dr. Mark Walker. My PhD was on the philosophy of Tiago Adorno, and it's the philosophy that really interests me, excites me, and a bit of occasion, a bit of art, a bit of music, a bit of painting, a bit of photography, a bit of film, a bit of wandering about. I've um, been here for many, 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 many moons, many moons, many moons, and uh, really interesting to uh, engage with some of your work this year. Yeah. Which, uh, is Interesting the way, my mind engages with your work. It's almost as though the furniture gets moved around and uh, we sort of come together in some kind of harmony. I think as you were saying, it's interesting how you know, there's similar ideas, or maybe that's the wrong thing to say, but just the way everything starts resonating and you start noticing other people's work, interesting ideas that cross fertilize with your own work. So uh, I look forward to the year and what arises from it. So one of the things that Mark um, so that you know he is a P the PhD tutor. Um, unpaid. Anyway, sorry. Um, but if you need um, some advice, uh, you're here basically on you're here on this day, right? Wednesdays. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and um, he can, he's particularly very strong on Adorno, but also Kant, and uh, a number of people. Actually, one of the things that's really uh, was interesting in your thesis was the chapter on the embodiment and the new, the notion of the new. Yeah. And we're just going to talk about new, because new science comes up a lot, and so this whole question of the new. Anyway. Um, I'm Barnaby Adams. I'm, I've been here a few years, uh, and I'm uh, currently writing up uh, my PhD, which is um, on George the French. Uh, George the French. George Bataille. the French. <laughs> Hello. George, George the French philosopher Bataille, he's, gonna, as you know in the ring. He's going to like. You're obviously finishing here. Um, <laughs> I can't even speak now. No, no, that's no, what happened. I'm going to start standing. Um, in particular, he's uh, uh, starting, well, reapproaching his work from the point of view of, of audition and hearing it. Um, in. This is going to be an extended version. This is um, uh, we, we mentioned punk in uh, 1979. Johnny wow. Rotten left the Sex Pistols and formed a band called Public Image Limited. And um, within a couple of years, uh, Public Image Limited, um, who took with them a lot of the punk audience, performed a show in New York, um, which they did from behind a screen. Um, it prompted amongst this audience of avant-gardists and punks howls of outrage and then a riot and um, 
It's this moment of violence and the screening off of the sound from its source, which had its um, roots in Pythagoras' screening off of his lectures uh, 2,000 years before Johnny Lydon did his, uh, did his performance. Um, it's this notion of violence which I want to associate with George Bataille's notion of sacrifice. Um, and in George Bataille's notion of sacrifice, there is the, the idea that there's this liberation because one can finally understand what it is to be dead. Um, and for me, I'm interested in hearing what these sounds are like after they're separated from their, um, their reference, their, the, the place where they came from. Um, and as objects, uh, what, they, what they're like post-sacrifice and whether they can be gathered together into um, uh, individual, individual puckerings, I suppose, in a sound, in a dark sound space, and whether they can give some kind of um, particular organising um, organizing sonic landscape to the human experience. You know, there's two MA students, actually three, you should actually meet who are also involved in absolutely this notion of how the object removed from its referent uh, operates as, as, a, as an auditory marker, as it were. Um, and so after the class, I'll give you the okay. emails. Uh, I meant to add that Dane is the CIFAR um, research uh, assistant. He's also the tu uh, number tutor with the contemporary uh, philosophy and aesthetics the MAP program basically. So if you need to understand uh, some of the um, background with um, Kant and with all the characters, you talk to these two. But if you want to talk to, what, if you want to understand the kind of, I think that you didn't mention the word religion, which I was surprised about because I think that's an important aspect. Um, I did sacrifice. But could you just elaborate slightly on that? <clears throat> Um, the, there's, a, there's a doubling in the position of uh, George Bataille who saw religion in terms of Christianity um, and in particular the invitation to uh, identify with the crucified, uh, crucified Christ who was both a body in pain and God itself and the Christian is invited to um, to identify with his pain, but it, but only on a mediated basis. As as, the, as Jesus died for the sin for the sins, of, Jesus died on behalf. Uh, so he's a mediated entity. Um, Batai was interested in not in, in removing that mediated state through meditation. So meditation of um, torture and pain. The inevitable problem is that um, if one dies, one no longer is able to have consciousness of the, of the state into which you've passed, the state of um, annihilation. Um, so through the notion of sacrifice, uh, where one substitutes, it, it, it's, it's, it complicates because it's, it, it both removes the medium and then, and then remediates it, restores it, it yeah. and then restores it. Um, but through the notion of sacrifice, um, sacrifice of one's self, sacrifice of one's consciousness, um, the stand-in becomes death. And there's this, there's this what I like to call um, superposition, um, where Are you there? <laughs> where something is where something is. Uh, it's not a term that Bataille used because I think it's uh, it's probably was invented around at the same time as he was writing, but in a completely different field. And also, it's a very... By Niels Bohr. Bohr. Yeah, but it, yeah. yeah, it's Niels Bohr, but it's also um, a piece of thing that Lauren's been working on, mm. as you know, or you may know. Um, and so, so that, that ability to, to experience death by, by sacrificing, through the sacrifice, um, so it gives, you an, it gives you an outlook onto the, the other side. Like. Do you have to sacrifice something that's into yourself, or do you have to sacrifice like an animal or something? Well, or I'm, not, I'm not sure. Plant? I'm not sure it's necessary. It's, it, it's it's the it's a token. Um, I mean, obviously, Bataille quite famously wanted to sacrifice a human. Um, 
and, trying to get out there. Yeah, um, so you know, he did take it quite literally. Um, I'm interested in what happened when, after, after, the, after the move to try and sacrifice a human um, didn't come to pass, uh, Bataille started to become quite prolific in his writing beforehand. Uh, he'd struggled. And um, I think that there's something there, that there's uh, the, the, the words that he had so many, so many problems with became post-sacrificial sounds and objects, and he was able to, he was able to see into um, other, other states of existence through the sacrificed words and sounds that had um, effectively been, been uh, uh, separated from their reference by, this viol by the violence of the, of the sacrifice, the lowering of the screen, and in the Bataille's case, the screen was night. But also the screen was the erotic, I would make a suggestion. Not, I'm not sure that that's necessary. I mean, there, there, are, there, are, many, there are many different um, symbolic reference within, within this, this, these, these screens. There's, there's a kind of dynamism that, um, that, that happens behind this, um, literally a, a kind of effusive movement and then a recuperation. Um, and the, it's the, the movement, the dynamism, which is more important than the... Uh, so the, so the, dynam the dynamic was itself the, it was self, itself the model. And whether it was uh, a model of um, vomit or defecation or, or sexual desire um, or sound... Or orgasm. Or, or orgasm sound, doesn't mean to say that, they, that all those things equate to each other but they all can fit into the dynamic model. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, the model, be, the model becomes, precisely what, what it suggests, it, a toolkit for, for uh, a placement and arrangement, um, mm. uh, which allows these things to sort of plug in and uh, effectively operate in the same way. Mm. Okay. And they, they, they op operate to uh, destroy um, a cohesive identity. And to recuperate it, because of it, in its destruction, it's, it's, it recuperates itself. Okay, we'll, get, we'll come back to that, otherwise I'll turn into a tutorial. Yeah. Um, quick no, comment, I, it just, I cannot disassociate what you're saying from um, the videos we've been forced to see of the people being killed yeah, in Syria. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know there, if you, I haven't been forced to see them. Well, in the, the way that, no, they are there, and I didn't watch them either, but they were on the first pages of all the websites online. The fact that the veiling you were talking about and the fact that there something was not veiled but there was something that turns out to work in an economy that is built so that then work can happen. Um, I can't, like, well, the more you were talking, the more this image was becoming present for me to, 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 as a question next to So, and the question is, is that, is what uh, Barnaby Stroke, the tie, Suggesting or the interpretation of the tie open to a wide ranging political read of which part can be reactionary? Is that what you're saying? Mm. Is that what you're I'm trying to get what, what is your actual Yes, question? yeah, well, I didn't, I, I did think that it was an, an, an intense political element in it that couldn't uh, go as far. I mean, I don't know about I, so for me to say it is reactionary or not, it would be a superficial external comment that wouldn't apply. But, um, Certainly, these because you, you, you were saying that the, <coughs> there is a token of sacrifice that is removed and then reinstated. Something very similar has happened with this manipulation communication that has been made by the West, not by the so called ISIS, uh, by in deciding to keep showing the videos we were sent. The West decided to yes. keep showing the videos. Mm -hmm. The media, the Western media, because they could, this could have been not shown, and it would not have stirred the age or it has stirred. Mm -hmm. So that something took place there that somehow resonates with what you said. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that's interesting. It's another dimension of how the sacrifice can work, it can get recuperated, for a political agenda, 
a, a wider political agenda, a state political agenda. And then on the other hand, there is the sacrifice of people that are fighting the, uh, the suicide bombing, that kind of thing, that, that form of the sacrifice, the martyrdom form. I think you could, you could say that um, the, from, an, from an ISIS perspective, these aren't sacrifices, they're executions. But for the West to, the West to show, the, show the videos, they're, they're repurposing the executions as sacrifices. No, but they're seeing it as a sacrifice because they're saying we've sacrificed this person because we haven't paid the ransom. So um, that person's been sacrificed to the greater cause, as it were. And so ISIS, ISIS see them as sacrifices. No, no, not ISIS. The West sees them yeah, as sacrifices. Yeah, the sacrifices, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So they're repurposing them. They're, they're, they're seeing that they've sacrificed this human being, but on the other hand, in so sacrificing, it's actually to solidify a position against the Middle East so that people will, will be able to unite against in an anger. So there's a political. I don't, I don't, I don't think you can use the, the term Middle East in terms of right, well, you, you know co coalescing ISIS kind of or, opinions against. You know, no, no, but I mean they're trying to bomb several countries around which they didn't have any kind of real popular anyway support to do it, and now they do because of the way in which those. Yeah, I mean I think that the 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 West the West are. Um, interpreting and sacrifice because it does allow for a recuperation, a coalescing, a solidification of a of a group which had a very nebulous identity. You know, they you can't see their faces, so there's this kind of sort of ant like sort of marching um, sort of terror and evil, which um, which understandably makes makes people uh, uh, very frightened. But it also it makes them want to retreat. And I think that by presenting the videos as sacrifices, it does give, um, you know, in the form of, you could see, you could see the moment, or you could read the moment in the in the British papers after mm -hmm. the first murder, where there was a reaching for um, a quite, a, quite a clumsy reaching for the, the the nomenclature of the executioner, and sort of, you know, we found out that we, we was he British? He appeared to be British from his accent, and and then people started to kind of the, the newspapers were slowly trying to settle on a name for this yeah. mass killer before finally, but, but not quickly, coming against up with Jihad, Jihadi John. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got there, you know, that, that, that moment was the coalescing um, and the recuperation of the, of the murder in, in a sacrificial term. So yes, there's, there is, it's an ability to see into, see into the other side. So in this case, seeing or experiencing the kind of, uh, I, mean, I think that most people would say that ISIS are kind of using, if in a battalion sense, are conflating um, creativity and evil in in a very battalion way. Yes. Um, but that's what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's double because it, it happens on Yeah, it, it's yes. a double move, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. To bring back to the blood sausage for a second, <laughs> have, you seen, have you seen Matthew Herbert's one pig? Well, no. you're aware of it. No, no. no. So, so um, Matthew Herbert, who's a kind of latter day Brian Eno, works very much. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, I know yeah. Matthew Herbert, I didn't That's know right. he did. So, he, he, he made, a, an al <laughs> well, he made <laughs> the album originally called One Pig. So, he bought, he, he bought a pig you know, and then recorded it for each month from its birth and each month of its growth through to the end of the year and its eating. So, the final, you know, the final track of the album is it's being eaten. And then um, realised this is a performance, which tour. Which, again, it's quite interesting in terms of the. the, the the sound having been removed from that source and then reintegrated back into something which is a symbolic moment. It's not, not necessarily as a, a performance of a, of a ritual or as a sacrifice of it, although it does finish with um, a chef on stage cooking. Uh, I was still admitting it's not a whole road, although it was done at St John's in London, which does hold those pigs. Um, and it was done as a performance there, but when I was at the QA, the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, it was um, you know, a chef at the yeah. back of the stage and some of the offal and other bits cooked. And it's called whole pig, one pig, one pig. Oh, thank you. Um, Follow that one, Stuart. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> I think I'm pastoral interviews. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm Stuart, um, artist, um, first year PhD student. Um, and the, working with the romantic British landscape tradition, um, I've just been to Scotland, walking. <laughs> I've made it back. I, well I didn't get eaten by any plants, but I am intrigued by 
this. What's it called? <laughs> it has a Latin name. Right. <laughs> and it's tall and it has like yellow spikes and they kill the sheep and then sheep decay and the plant feeds on the decays of the sheep. Uh, it fertilizes the ground that the plant lives on. Right. That's what I know, but I don't know the name. I mean, more, more modestly, I do see the little sun dunes, which are like the native things fly traps. Yeah. So they're, they're, they were carnivorous plants. I, I know, see. it's fascinating, so, yeah. isn't it? Um, anyway, so, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's all I can contribute to that. Um, I, I was wondering a little bit about the possibility of your parhesiastic relationship with landscape um, from reading this, this um, Foucault. And can you um, stretch that a little bit? Um, I, I was, well, it, was, it was clear yesterday when I was reading it, um, but it did feel a bit one sided because in, in, in this, I feel it's much more. It's got the, the doubling to it, but there's a, there's a, there's the, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's gone now, but there was that sense of, there was something in it, actually, I did write a note, yeah. so maybe that will help. But I, um, Just say what page it's on. Well, no, I, no, yeah, okay. sorry, I will if I, if I, if I find it. Um, but I was or at least which lecture. Yeah, I think it was. Um, and just remember, in the Foucauldian lectures, it's like first lecture, first hour and then so if you're asked to read lecture one if there's two hours worth there's two sections um, so I wrote it on page 13 uh, I, don't know why. I put it as a necessary exchange the experience of one so I think okay just, so, just <coughs> but it was I was thinking about the um, um, when you're walking climbing up the mountain and the, the, the varying gradients, how, the, how your exertion alters. And I was, I was sort of thinking about how, it, in a way, it's forcing you into yourself. You become more focused. You're not looking around you. You've got to look at the feet or two or even the almost vertical in front of you. Um, but then I thought it's more about sort of herniation, that the land, it's the landscape pushing further into you rather than that sort of traditional so now I'm looking at the big view. So it's, um, Herniation. Is that a word you made up? That's made fantastic. Up. <coughs> it's but a I, great I, word. But I see that in the fold, you know, the, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the absolutely. topography of the fold yeah. image. I see that as some sort of... Yeah, it yeah. is like a herniation, yeah. yeah. Or so, a hernia that's been... Yeah. <laughs> you seem to see in the landscape has the hernia rather than well, it's yeah, rather I'm than not, you. I'm, yeah. It's protruding <laughs> into you rather than... You are the hernia of the landscape. I would say, yeah, the landscape is pushing in, is what I'm thinking at the yeah. moment. But it's pushing in you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there's, there's also the reason. Have you noticed that there's a, a difference when you're in shape versus not quite as in shape? Um, I would, yeah, probably when you're, you're less, I would say you're less in tune. What I've noticed, because I've now been bike riding a lot, mm. and um, there are a lot of hills in the city. I just want to mention that. And actually, as it turns out, a lot of hills in London. So anyway, who knew? Uh, but I found that when I first started, it was just as you're describing. You're really concentrated. You know, am I going to get to the mm. middle of the next part of the hill? And and the more in shape you get, the less herniated <laughs> the land comes yeah. onto you. But I, I'm not necessarily saying that that's a bad thing. No, no, I'm not it's, saying it's a it's, Yeah, and I, I, No, the reason I mention it is that there's a lot of conditions around which the herniation can happen. It's not mm. just the gradient. Yeah, yeah. You know, it could be the I thought you meant aesthetically. The, the, the aesthetics of the landscape were, were you were having a kind of herniated experience aesthetically. Well, like, sometimes yeah, they're like, pushing into you and sometimes... But I, did, I think that kind of is there, that yeah. there as well, it's included in it. Mm. Yeah, I think that is what you were saying, yeah, actually. Um, but the, the, the mix yeah. sort of alters depending on the, the experience, what's going on. I mean, if it's the weather, you know, I was up on one mountain and it was the wind was blowing and, you know, the rain going into you. <coughs> somehow that's a, that's a more immediate thing. You are, you are sort of, you've got your waterproof up in that but, but then on a gradient, you know, it's a, one of the days, you've got a gorgeous, beautiful day, if you're still there, sort of, Breathing hard, mountain kind of there. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it has different 
um, yeah, different mixes, different proportions, depending on the, mm. um, the yeah, because the whole idea of landscape for me is that, you know, I'm trying to sort of push against the, the picturesque as it were, that landscape becomes pretty. Uh, yeah, so there's a massive thing. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> Interesting. Yeah. Okay, last but not least. Um, yeah, my work, like yours, looks at objects removed from reference. Um, and this year I've published a couple of articles on um, one is a rattling sound in a play, it sort of recurs a lot. Um, and the other is a boy who sort of becomes a wall, he sort of merges into the wall. Um, and this has led me to be interested in the idea of the pro scanner, the front of the um, stage, and the ob scanner from which the word obscene derives. Um, and I'm trying to write a book proposal, um, which gets it all. <laughs> um, but I, my work, I haven't used George Bataille, but I have used Lacan's work on desire, which has really been very useful mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. formulating and understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, which part of, which work? In the car. Um, the graph of design. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm wanting to propose a theory of radical interruption, <laughs> but for things to be radical, they have to be interrupted. Um, <laughs> but isn't that the basis of a lot of the discontinuity theories, as it were? That the whole question of the discontinuous time and the, the notion that, that uh, there's no more unities, there's only the discontinuous levels of symmetry, asymmetry, that kind of thing. That that is, in fact, that, you know, they said the loops and, um, and that whole range, you know, leotard and so on. Would you, would you I think what, what's different about what you're suggesting? My grasp of the post lacanians is that they are interested in difference more than identity. And my thinking is that identity and difference, as in Heidegger, need to be together. Right. Um, but they're separated. They they don't add up. So by talking about a radical interruption it implies that there's something on not either side, but there's something that is involved that is getting yeah. interrupted. But mm -hmm. wouldn't that be similar to the Deridian abyss then? Is isn't that the Deridian deep cut when he's talking about truth and painting and so on, when he talks about this the, line, the marker on the canvas, the, the violence of that. Yeah, I think it would be, yeah. So if I, it, so what would be, I, I think you're onto something, yeah. I, I just, what would be the thing that you're pushing at that makes it different from that? Um, I, I, I'm uh, pushing at, um, I'm trying to see it in dramatic terms. <laughs> in terms of like drama, the, because yeah. I'm analysing the plays of Edward Bond and I'm looking at how he sort of radicalises signs. So coming from a theatre background, I'm saying that um, uh, to be radical in the theatre, you have to dis disturb the sign itself. Mm -hmm. um, radical theatre, Brechtian theatre, has put signs against signs. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm saying that's not radical enough now. It's about destabilizing the sign itself, which is removing the... That makes me so happy to hear that. I feel like you're finally leaving the shore of Lacan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting... I'm, I'm able to articulate it more. I have really been trying this summer to write a book proposal, but I haven't succeeded. you get there. We'll help you. Okay. Any questions to anybody? Good. Let's begin. Um, what I'd like to sort of read just restate, reshape, is to remind you that we're looking at Courage of Truth by Foucault. It's a, uh, it's a the, the book series, the lecture series, was uh, presented at the Collège de France in 79, and he was trying to work out a way, uh, one, one of the things he was trying to do was work out a way in which one understood that there is a thing called truth. That, that is to say, that there is. It, it's a bit of a. It's a challenge to the usual arguments that there's no such thing as truth, or the sort of poorer understandings of relativity to think that means anything goes. Now, in order to do that, you need a ground. 
that, that is the primary aspect. In order to make an argument that there is truth, there has to be a ground. And as we know from the seminar, for those of you that have been involved with it for years and those of you that are just coming on, that notion of the ground is very problematic. And so, and Foucault, of course, is quite aware of this. So what he starts to develop and what we're going to see that he develops, and then we're going to, I'm going to shift over to uh, Kant, is that he begins to develop the way in which the ground is always, it's a, it's a contested terrain, I use the word terrain very knowingly here, the contestation about the terrain is based on ethics, not on object, so-called objective facts. And the ethics are not morals, don't get them confused. The ethics are wider platforms, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, but I just want to put it slightly differently. Morals tend to be the rules around which the social organizes itself. Ethics is the ability to have the actual environment so that something can be organized. Uh, I, last week I tried to explain it as there's the web versus the internet. Uh, for those of you that are savvy about um, how that operates, um, and even those that don't, you know that the World Wide Web is a very different animal than the Internet. The Internet is kind of like the infrastructure, like the roads on the, on, the, on the environment, but then there's this thing called the environment, that's the web. It's the same idea with the ethics here. Now, there's a lot of different ways into this question of ethics, but, uh, and I, and one of the ways in is called Zitvikite, which is S-I-T-T-I-C-H-K-E-I-T, -T -T -E Zitvikite. And it means ethical community. This is a word that is bandied about in German quite a lot from Kant onward. And um, I felt last week that we didn't quite, we got so lost in the various translations, which was fine, but we didn't quite get a sense of what really is kind of going on in sort of this, let's say, meta level. So the Foucauldian lectures on the truth, he calls them the courage to truth. Now that is a normative remark. You tell someone they're courageous, that's a lot different than calling someone a coward. To, to, to mark it as courageous, you, let's say you run into a burning building to save a child of yours that's dying. Probably most parents would not call themselves courageous. They would call themselves, that's what you do. That, that's, so I want to be very clear here. And that's kind of what Foucault is saying. That's what you do. But sadly, we've gotten so removed from that as, as knowledge that it needs to be re-established as courage so that people get the idea of what's good, that, that actually you need to initiate something, even though partially it's maybe instinctual, but I don't mean that it's in your genes. I mean that you just think, yeah, I'm going to go and get that kid. Now, so the first two lectures, we'll, we'll circle back to that in a second. Think about the fact that if there's a truth, there needs to be a ground, but there's a problem with the notion of ground, because to take Jacob's nervousness about or worry about um, layers, the ground tends to present implacable or immovable objects, boundaries that do not have some sort of, um, you know, entry points or exit points. And we know that with Kant and the question of the Enlightenment, he begins, as does Foucault when he's reviewing Kant's version of the Enlightenment, by stating that the Enlightenment names the moment when the, the moment, like a historical moment, the, the, the event of the Enlightenment. It's not like Tuesday at 4 o'clock there was a thing called the Enlightenment. The event called Enlightenment happened when it was clear that, that the change that was, that, that was being uh, promoted actually was the ground of the social. To put change as the ground, as opposed to a solid ground as the ground, was a very big move. Now I want to get back to this, because I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page, that everybody gets this very important point. This change for 
Descartes, for example, we were talking about this yesterday in the MA class. For Descartes, he lists this as doubt. Doubt is the basis of the ground. Why? Because it doesn't close off. It doesn't, it keeps things open. We're not talking about the doubt that is, I don't believe you, that form of doubt. We're talking about a doubt that, we're talking about the fact that the word doubt could really be the word fractal. It doesn't have an edge. It can't close. It, 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 doubt could be a sound. It doesn't have the edge of it. There's no uh, boundary around this thing. So, Kant, uh, sorry, Descartes' you know, formula, which got lost in the translation of the Cartesian move, is I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, is what usually gets picked up, but it's actually I doubt. Not I doubt in the sense that I don't believe it. You're not, not, nobody's like Victor Meldrew here. I doubt, therefore I am able to realize that there's nothing on the ground except that which is constituted as the way to move. So the assemblage of entities of some kind, which we'll get to, form a ground. Now that assemblage of entities, Foucault is going to name a certain form of paharegia, or a certain form of zetesis, the search, the curiosity, and we'll get into that. But what Kant does is he wants to name it a judgment. He wants to say that the ground is a judgment. Now again, the judgment isn't, I think you're good, you're not so good. It's not a, it's not a moral judgment in this sense. It's a transcendentalist judgment. So, and that way I would like to, I would like to set the seminar going by first looking at Kant again, unless you really feel that we should look at Foucault first. Which would you rather do? Because each one, what needs to be understood here is the importance of how the first step is being taken. And by first, we don't, is not meant like primary, like the, the you know, step one. It means the way to begin the argument, we just start here. We can start there, we can start there, we can start there. But you just start. And the start is what we're calling first. Okay? Can someone open a window? It's really warm in here. Yeah. There's the stick there against the wall. <coughs> just, just be careful of the um, photograph. Thank you. So, I'll just um, rephrase this so you get the, the picture here. We were, we decided as a group last year, uh, to go into Kant and Foucault. And one of the reasons to, to I think, that that, was, that decision was taken was because we had, at that point, looked at the question of ground, groundless grounds, notions of event, works on one-dimensionality, time, space, and so on. What I'd like to suggest, in order to organize your thoughts so that you can at least grasp what you need to grasp and move forward, is that we're still dealing with this question of the ground. And the reason one deals with the question of a ground is because it is what makes you decide or not decide, rationally or irrationally or non-rationally, I should say, the next step. What comes next? So what you have moment one, what makes moment two happen? How do you get from moment one to moment two? In a postmodern, or let's say even modern view, if change is the basis, that has a lot of ramifications of what you understand as being human and all of this kind of stuff. I'm not going to rehearse all that. But what is being suggested here, and it's following a very specific trajectory, which you should go back and read about if you're not sure of it at the moment. We start with doubt. We start with the notion of doubt, by which is meant, like I was saying last night, the color green. Doubt could be like the color green, or the color red, or the color pink, or something, in the sense that the, 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 the territory around which that color operates doesn't have an edge. You were pointing out red. And yeah, it could have been any color. Like, we have red here, red here, 
red here, and there's the, the, the couple reds around. Can you explain the ish side of this? This well, is the Wittgensteinian point. Within the problem of um, making sure that uh, a noun corresponds to an object, you know, the, the, the problem of the proper name, which is that called, so, is, is bringing the example of colors. Uh, it has the color red, for example, but it is fairly easy to say that this is red. Yeah. Uh, somehow this is the center of what we call redness, or near the center. But there are plenty of other instances that are quite far off the center where red is red-ish. That version, this version, something in here, this color here. And when is the red no longer red and becomes entirely brown, or entirely yellow, or purple, that there is a clear boundary. Its identity becomes a curve, which is very easy to identify or to point out in the center, and then tapers off asymptotically. You know, over the edges. So it's uh, it, it, not that, um, um, that everything is shaken up in terms of ground. But there are some positions that are rather clear. And then boundaries, which could might well be seen as the next step, is as remain not fully defined or better problematic. So to, to sort of get at the, thank you, that's good. To get at this point that's trying to be made is that it's like asking the question, what is the condition around which something can emerge? What is the condition? One way of saying it is doubt is the condition, or ish is the condition. It's a, it's a kind of ground that, that, it's a kind of environment that creates a plateau under which nothing else can, can or you can't go any further back. That's what the ground is about. The ground says you go here and no further. You're not going to keep falling through. The ground gives you some form of stability so that you can move forward. That's what the ground does in, in any form of logic, in any form of anything. It gives you a position around which you can move forward. Now Kant is, is challenging three different versions of how to understand this. Version one is empiricism. Version two is skepticism. Version three is indifference. I mean, it is all in the Kantian work. And he's saying that these three major, major arguments that have happened in philosophy and meaning and science and all the rest of this, they err in various ways. Empiricism errs because it's putting forward an idea and is trying to prove an idea. Um, skepticism errs because it allows for too much relativity. Indifference errs because it doesn't center on any uh, one object. It just it just uh, sort of uh, ignores the situation. And what he's saying is that he's really taking a pot shot at the empiricist. That's Hume, that crowd, or uh, Locke. Uh, um, he, and he's basically saying that when you think about this thing called, there's, there's two aspects going on. One is an attack on tradition, an attack on non-change by saying that if we're going to take seriously that the ground, or that, let's say, the basis of society is change, if we're going to say that the ground of society is that there is no ground, or to put it a little bit more politically obvious, that the ground of society is always freedom. The word freedom is meaning by that this open-ended public kind of gets into. If you're going to take that as the ground, and he wants to take it as the ground, because if you take that as the ground, you're going to have a different set of ethics a different set of politics, a different set of science that comes out of it than if you take something else as a ground. Now, you don't get to sit there and choose, well, which ground am I going to have? And he's basically suggesting that to the degree to which one can choose, that comes into different processes of art, uh, different types of sciences, but he, he's basically challenging 
the empiricists because they're not sensuous enough, the skeptics because they're over-sensuous, the indifferent people because they're neither nor. And he's saying, in order to come, to, in order to take seriously the role of God, religion, art, uh, se the senses, sexuality, experience, you can take none of them as a given. You can take none of them as a first cause. If you take any of them as a first cause, it's going to throw off, it's going to already package what you're trying to do. So he basically presents the argument around, and this is what made me think of Marx's uh, thesis so long ago, well not that long ago, but um, a little while ago, uh, on the question of the new. He basically wants to rethink this new. And he wants to say, if you remember, in seven, now when, when is he writing this? He's writing this in what, 1789 or something, right? 1791. Judgment was 1991. Was it? 1991. 1991, okay, well, so Vico, Giambattista Vico, writes in 17, what was that? 18. 17. 17. <laughs> It, Gian Battista Vico writes a book called The New Science, which was revolutionary. He writes it in Italy. He writes many versions of it. Get the, get the 1744 version. Um, he, he kept correcting, changing. 1744. And even with that one, I think there's the third edition that came out in 1744. It's a very specific one that is actually the one that than Kant and the rest of the characters used. You have to sort of do a detective work. And to, to put it in a nutshell, or to put it in a kind of very potted history way, how do you figure out what's right and wrong? Well, if God is giving you the law, it's not that difficult in the sense that you're, to you're following the rules. So the, the, the purveyor of truth is God, and you are the receiver of that truth. And that's kind of it. So change is always God's will. A plant grows, a plant dies. Your child grows, your child dies. Whatever it is, it's God's will. Now, that's fine on one level, but what, what was happening, not to get into a whole um, cultural story of it, but just to say that at least analytically what's going on here is that how do you account for the fact that actually not all cultures look alike, have situations alike, have different rules. You know, one way to argue is, well, the cultures that don't agree with the culture that you're in are barbaric. You'd have to take that position. If, if God is presenting how things get done and you're believing in one type of God, then that type of God is right, you're following God's will, and everybody else who's not doing it, they're wrong. Now, in order to take on the modernist position, you have to change that view. And Vico <coughs> put out the book called New, The New Science, which basically, summarized, says there's actually two types of science. There's two types of knowledge, both of which were called science. So there's the old science, which is religion, and inside of that came things that were not explainable, like how a tree grew, or could you get to the moon, or even the moon. These were things, so different types of science, different types of chemistry. Um, physics was a very late um, science in that sense, but you know, mathematics, these were all a part of God science, as it were. But then there was this other thing called the new science. The new science, the other branch, was humanities. And the argument was that God did certain things and people did other things. And sometimes they, they crossed over, and sometimes they didn't. And so that change that was finally brought to bear in the hands of being human, the human change, was quite radical. So it moved the Archimedean point, that being God, and the Archimedean point was what, that which gave meaning. So this Archimedean point, in fact, Archimedes comes up with this idea, the Archimedean point, which gives them meaning to things that are going on, shifts and the Archimedean point becomes human beings. Usually male human beings to start with, and it gets wider and different. But 
So that Archimedean point was put at the basis of being human, but the Archime it's the Archimedean point that we're now calling ground. And so Kant takes this, and he says, I want to I am going to now present a new science, a, new, a newer science. This newer science is following the new science, as it were, of Biko. So 50 years later, he's writing this work, The Critique of Judgment. And in it, he makes an argument that this new science will be called the transcendental, the, the transcendental analytic transcendental doctrine. He's making an argument that whatever this thing is that we're going to call it, we're going to say that it includes the senses but doesn't privilege experience. So it's got to be based on reason, but the reason that it's based on has to be grounded. But the ground that it's grounded on is an Archimedean point that's, that's based on change. For that to make any sense whatsoever, he's developing a whole set of arguments that follow an aesthetic and follow um, a, a sort of a mathematical move that create, taken together, different forms of judgment. Or the form of judgment, yeah. To what extent is um, his project a, a move away from divine determinacy? and towards the logic of indeterminacy. 100%. The problem is, which is interesting about this problem, if you notice, you know, all these characters who are trying to talk around the God, the so-called God problem, I'll call it, uh, always, or it's either the God problem or it's the monarchy problem, okay? Um, because, and they either have to say that, you know, whatever we're saying, I really believe in God. I mean, he probably, you know, he was, quite religious, but he also dedicates his work to Frederick the Great. In fact, he actually has a line in there where he starts talking about how important the monarch is if he understands how you need to allow for the public to have this freedom, to have this Archimedean point be not uh, contained. And this is what Foucault is taking from Kant, I mean, he's saying a number of things, but this is one of the things. So what Foucault borrows and then bases a lot of his work, including this Courage of Truth book, series of lectures, is that the truth that, I'm sorry, is that the uh, indeterminacy, as you would put it, that, that Kant is putting forward actually still creates a coherent, a coherent society. It's just a society that you don't know what the answer is. And that's... Kant. Uh, you can't know what the answer is. And to want to know what the answer is, is not going to get you further. But what it is going to do is that in the search for answers, certain things will be developed. Positive things. Other? No, no, no. Questions, 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 questions? Really? How are you doing? Is this making sense? It's beginning to be You sure? I love the beginning to part. Yeah. Just making sense? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. It's definitely not making sense. Okay, maybe. What about you? Making sense? Don't know why we're even looking at this. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna play a little game, and then we're gonna open book. Uh, this is the game I tried last night as well, but I don't know what it's called. Mm -hmm. No, this is a new game. This is supposed to be. Okay, so. Can you visualize what a groundless ground would look like? I've got a pivot in my head. A pivot, what does um, that mean? A thing that goes a seesaw. Okay, <laughs> all right. Anybody else? But a groundless ground. Forget about why we need a groundless ground. Zero. Zero is a groundless ground. Okay, people are going to shoot you. And it's help. <laughs> okay, yeah. Chris? Oh, I sort of started thinking of mountains like with, you know, those little ledges. So you can still go down or you can go up or you can go across. So continually shifting. Okay. Not a firm basis. Okay, let's think, I take it back. Let's think why do we need to understand ground when 
you're working on knitting and other people are working on, you know, I don't know, curating, why do we have to understand the ground? What does the ground have to do with anything? I want that to do with truth. So okay, it has to do with the truth. Thing, we're, we're sort of making a statement, so we're kind of deploying a regime of truth, and that might be deployed in different ways. So let's say, this is my wonderful, see I clean the office. Oh, the no no the one truth. has mentioned how clean this looks, by the way. It's because it's full of people, you can't see anything. <laughs> anyway, ignore him. Okay, salt. Now, we're going to do the practice of groundless ground. Obviously, that's a table, but pretend nothing were there. Now, nothing is there, and yet the salt stays on the groundless ground. It doesn't go any further down. It doesn't go anywhere. Get that? You see how it just doesn't go any further down? So if you're trying to make a comment about something and the, it doesn't go any deeper, it doesn't go any further than that position. So in your PhDs, you're going to make a claim and it's not going to go any further than that position. Right? Right again. Do you want to try throwing it? So it's not going to go any through. Go ahead, give it a go. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> See, this is how you come up with your thesis. This is, your thesis is not going to go any further than the pretend furthest back it can go. That's your ground. You cannot have a research question without a ground. The ground, anybody else want to try it? That table now has more salt in it than last week's pizza. It's true, and that's quite Just. a lot. Is anybody else going to try trying it? <laughs> Nobody else wants to try it. a shy group doing it. I'll try it from over here, Thank John. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to throw the box? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all right. Don't worry. I'll make a mess of this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, throwing salt is for good luck. Okay, ready? Okay. Now. The research question can't go any further than that ground, except we know that it's a fake ground, in the sense that nobody's sitting there with the ground going, this is as far back as you can go. You can't go any further back with your research question, right? We know, so the question is, how did you come up with that ground? How did you come up with, other than the fact, pretend that this doesn't really exist, that this blue table with the plastic on top that, that Gay actually made this was her job, yes. Yes, when she first came in. I know, that was scary. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, bloody hell. My ground shifted, Johnny. <laughs> okay. Okay, don't even ask where that salt's been. Yeah. Okay, um, okay so the ground, it, the salt doesn't go any further than what is that ground. And that is the true aspect, that is the full aspect, that is all that there is to it. You can't go any further down. There's nothing deeper that exists. So how do you know that what you're saying <coughs> is, is it, is the, tr is the truth? How do you know? How do you know to do that? You need a ground. Now, if you have a ground that says, well, my ground is that in 1973, something happened, and I'm going to start with that you would fail your PhD. That would not be the ground. That would just be some arbitrary date that you picked. So you'd have to then explain, why did you pick that date? And then you'd have to say, well, in what, what came up to the, you know, what should we test about that date that makes it so special? And you say, well, you know, on that date, there was the oil crisis. You know, well, it didn't affect me. I wasn't even born. You know, so, so how do you pick that date? So you see what I mean? Like, how far back do you go? Now, Wittgenstein says, how, like if I say, well, no, let me start it again. G.E. Moore stated that if I have a hand, I can tell you this is my hand, and you don't have to doubt that. And then if I can, I can prove that by saying, now I have two hands, so you know there are two hands here. 
And GE Moore basically says, da da, that's my argument. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but it basically, this is his argument. And Wittgenstein goes into a complete rage for the entire uncertainty book, where he goes on and on and on about the stupidity of saying that you understand something because you see a hand. You say, this is a hand, no one's doubting it's a hand. If I had it under wraps, would you think that there maybe was a foot instead of a hand there, or maybe I had amputated my hand and I just had this thing? How do I actually know? that this is, in fact, a hand, and not only that, it's my hand. How do you know that it's my hand? Well, I mean, it's a ridiculous question, basically. But something makes you know this, and that something is not by having a second hand. There's no reason to pick the hand, because then maybe, as Wittgenstein says, well, maybe then you say, well, if I see a hand, maybe I then have to test my eyes. Because how do I know that my eyes are not playing tricks on me? How do I know, how do I know, in fact, how do I know this is reality? How do I know that we're in reality? This is, this is the big question, you know, is, is, are we all dreaming right now? <laughs> you wish. <laughs> no, sadly, this is your hell. Okay, so, the thing is, is that you have to figure a way to pick out the ground that allows you to make your research question stable. This problem, um, when, when we come to, to see it um, from the victim's standpoint, I think it, it's very important to uh, keep in mind that when, the, the problem of the hand, right? while one doubts that this is a hand, it is my hand, and I shot bullet through it, and the pain would certainly be a self evident thing, and I would actually, if it were a hand, hit the person with discretion it, because <laughs> but, no, it, who had it, shot it. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what is very important is to, to realize, I, 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 at least I think that that's where the question starts, is that this self-evidence per se is meaningless. And what, what's important that uh, Wittgenstein looks at it by linking the, self, the self-evidence with language. Um, and the two things together, sense, make sense, not, not make sense as in they have meaning, but they make the, the possibility of meaning and the situation of meaning. So, um, the, the, and the, the problem he has with, with more is precisely that he does not make this step, he just remains with the basic syllogism of this. I've got a hand, it's, a, it's obvious, it's not about all, all about hands, common sense rules, and all the your questioning are just small. stupid. Yeah. yeah. Um, Instead of it, is what Bittes in other books calls a tuck, which is not a synthesis but a combination of sort between. What is a synthesis actually? Yes, but it's not the synthesis. Uh, well, not, not okay, yeah, you're right. Anyway, it, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the dynamic or the economy between the object and the noun, the object and the language, and how they constantly operate together uh, with, in, in a meaningful way. So we are already speaking about something that is quite elaborate. Mm -hmm. So in other words, whatever ground you think you're picking, there's, there's already something there that has allowed you to make sense of that, literally. Now, now Wittgenstein is going to call this language games, literally. He calls this whole phenomenon language games. And he wrote his first work, the Tractatus, um, he wrote basically setting up the thing, the tool, toolkit, toolbox, which he rejected, um, saying that he had, missed, he had misunderstood himself and demanded that the publishers remove all the copies. Of course, they wouldn't do this. And of course, um, he's now seen as being very famous for this book that he hated. Okay, so be careful in the stuff you put out, <laughs> because you will be known by the thing that you hate most. Yeah. It's, um, it's a film I saw uh, this week, which um, sounded like the, the maker was a bit of a fan of Wittgenstein. It's called uh, an American film called Winter's Bone. I don't know if anybody's oh, yeah. seen it. Have yeah. you seen it? No. But um, so to, this is a bit of a spoiler alert, but um, <laughs> uh, a, a, a daughter is um, abandoned, a, an adult daughter is, a, is abandoned with her younger siblings by her father who's uh, skipped bail um, because he can't face 10 years prison on a drugs charge. Um, and she needs to uh, find him to uh, otherwise she's going to forfeit the house that they live in um, uh, as part of his bail bond. It transpires that he's um, been murdered uh, for, for grassing up some local drug dealers. 
and the local drugs dealers who are kind of it's uh, it's all set in the uh, American South. It's the only film I've ever, right. I've ever I really need subtitles. It's all Str horrible. Str it? Struggle to understand <laughs> the English, but um, the the women of the family take her to find her father's body, which is in the middle of a swamp and underwater, and they say, "Oh, don't worry, he's." He's only just under the surface. So uh, she sort of reaches down in the dead of night and pulls up this hand, like this. At which point, the sort of matriarch of the, of the family of drug stealers hands her a chainsaw and says, right, off you go, you know, cut the, cut the hand off. And um, she, can't, she can't bring herself to do it. So the matriarch says, well, you hold it like this and, and I'll do it. So, she cuts, the, she's holding her father's hand as it's cut off the corpse. Actually, you know, the Deep South is like this. <laughs> she, she wraps it up like this, and she's like, you know, understandably quite distressed. And she sort of turns to go, and, she, and the woman, the, the matriarch, says, why do you let go of the, why do you let go of the arm? She said, well, you know, we've got the hand. She said, they, they know that trick. <laughs> they said, she's going to need the other one. And so she has to reach in again and get the other hand. Because what she's got is, is what she's got isn't enough. You know, one hand isn't the grounds. You yeah. need to have two hands. But to, see, that's actually to more. Okay, right. I'm just saying. Okay, but well, it sounds like the makers of this film stepped right in the middle of this argument. Yeah. Didn't they? yeah. Well, it's a very famous argument. It's like Zeno's paradox in the sense that the argument is: How do you know what your ground is, and how do you know how far back you can go before? Your supervisor goes, no, okay, you've made it to the ground. You know, like, how do you know how far you can go? Now, especially if we've just said there is no such thing as a ground, <laughs> right? Okay, so here's the paradox. It's it's kind of like Chris's uh, discussions about boundaries. The boundary, instead of being like this, a boundary, it's you know, it's, it's the surface kind of situation. So you're throwing your ideas on uh, out onto this ground, and the ones that stick are going to cohere in some way. And Wittgenstein, sorry, not Wittgenstein, uh, what's his name, Kant, has a very... Sorry. Anyway, which is better than the way I used to pronounce it, let me tell you. Um, so, this guy, Emmanuel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I'm just very really grateful you moved out of southeast London. Yeah, really. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> pronunciation, you're going to even get in trouble. Well, they did get me in trouble. In fact, uh, the first time it was thir third year students, and uh, as Mark was rightly saying, I was dressed all in leather because at that time um, I used to dress like this, uh, and then the students weren't paying any attention, so I decided, oh, forget this, I'll just dress like I go night clubbing which was perfect, and I dressed all my leathers, and um, I introduced Kant to them, and of course they heard Kant, and they were, wow, this philosophy is very interesting. You know, who is this Immanuel Kant? You know, and it was like, and they were like very impressed, and I was like, you know, so I'm writing on the board, and everybody starts, you know, uh, laughing, and this kind of thing, because they thought I spelled it wrong. <laughs> which is even better. Anyway. Little digression. Um, okay, now what Kant is doing is that he's he is suggesting that this thing called the ground is not the starting off point, which is usually what is in either skeptic or an empiricist, the, the empiricist form starts with "I have two hands" or whatever the ver version is, and now I'm going to go off and tell you something about it. That for Kant is just a description. It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't even prove that you have two hands, which can become deeply annoying if you're not a philosopher because it seems like, well, but you do have two hands. <laughs> you know, but you are Grace, you are, or whatever, the, you know, Blanche. You know, so it's like, you know, so it's like the, the argument he starts to talk about is trying to understand this word metaphysic and transcendental. And he makes a wider claim around the difference between the, this, a thing called an analytic and a thing called a synthetic. An analytic judgment versus a synthetic judgment. And the synthetic judgment is that which comes out of 
I'm going to say it in a, as careful as I can because I don't want you to think layers. It's not so. So when you synthesize something, there are no layers. But when it becomes a big pot of soup, let's say it's when a synthetic thing happens, it doesn't erase the individual discrete aspects of the thing. So a synthetic something, an a priori synthetic entity, or what you call a judgment, an a priori synthetic or a synthetic judgment is that which maintains its characteristics, or what he'll call qualities. And it's very specific. He doesn't mean quality as in being really cool and good. He means quality as in, that's the word he used, like palimpsest. So the quality is that which creates a synthetic move. And, and its coherence is for Kant the ground. And he argues that the analytic is the reasoned side, that is to say, the usual form of logic. By that, as I say, moment one, if I say one, two, three, four, we know the next number is not a hard question. <laughs> Five. Five. <laughs> You're scaring me. Okay, I'm going to start throwing salt again. Okay. So, so if I say one, two, three, four, five. If I said one, two, three, four, tree, six, seven, eight, nine, two trees. Tree, two trees. <laughs> okay. You could do that. And in this way, we move things around. Now, he's actually attacking the, uh, you know, kind of the sign signifier thing. You could see this because the synthetic, he's attacking it before it actually was written, but anyway. Because his notion of how something becomes the ground is that it has an a priori unity. This a priori synthetic unity is a ground. So it's already there. Now, this is where the challenge comes between him and Foucault. Because for Foucault, the ground is not already there, but I don't want to confuse you any further. I just want to, let's just go with Kant to start with. And the analytic can never work as a ground. So if you say to somebody, you know, I think that you're racist. And the person goes, well, why do you think I'm racist? And then you explain, well, because you're acting like an idiot. You're saying this, this, and this. Uh, and that is a racist. And the person goes, oh, God, I knew there was something wrong. Thank you. I now have been. I've now gone through reason, I've, I've reasoned it out, I've followed your argument, and now I'm going to change. And Kant says that, what's that? Get punched in the face. Punch in the face, <laughs> yeah. That is not going to do any form of change. The analytic is a tool, but it's not a great tool in the sense that it's not going to actually build a house, though it's required on some level to have a plan. I don't want to like, push this argument too far, but the point is, is that the notion of logic as an analytic logic can't stand on its own. It requires a synthetic unity. Now, for Kant, it's an a priori synthetic unity. That is to say that it exists prior to the moment of its happening. But he calls the system of analytic plus synthetic and architectonic. A R C H E C T O N I C. Architect, like an architect, tonic. Architectonic. So the architectonics, which is a great word, actually, and a lot of people use it. In fact, a number of my PhD students um, a couple of years ago had it in every chapter. The architectonics is this and that. It's a lovely word, actually, because it says that I'm using both the analytic and the synthetic. Now, I'm hoping that this gives you a little bit more of an entry point so that now when we look at Emmanuel, you'll hear it, but to know that what Foucault is taking, what Heidegger even takes, is this notion of how something can be bound together can have its edges, as it were,
that is to say, it doesn't lose its qualities, but instead it still makes something that can't be divided off. If you took the qualities out, they would just disappear. They wouldn't have any meaning. What are you here? Are you here? Is this making any sense? What? Wait, wait. You have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Your use of the word groundless ground. What actually? Did you actually exactly mean by that? Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, there's a book on the table right there. Um, yes, that one, Groundless Grounds, yeah. by Lee Braver. Um, <coughs> We spend an entire year, basically, on it. Uh, but, but if God is not the basis of truth, and if man is not the basis of truth, if mathematics is not the basis of truth, what is the basis of truth? Is it just a power struggle? Whoever wins is the basis of truth. And Kant wants to say no. So he's following a Socratic move. Say no, that is not the basis. You can't privilege God, man, mathematics, the senses. You can't privilege any of them. You have to figure out how they all kind of come together to make this ground. Now, Einstein, in his notion of relativity, so stay with me because we'll get there next semester, but Einstein, in his famous equation, E equals MC squared, the equal sign pulls together these two slices, energy, very ephemeral, mass uh, times velocity squared, very ephemeral, pulls them together, and they don't require a ground to make sense. You don't need an observer, you don't need anything. So the way quantum physics was under, was fine, they cracked the code on it, was to get rid of the ground. They realized the problem has been the ground. However, we're not there right now. What, I should never mention groundless grounds. I should only say <laughs> invisible ground, like a synthetic ground. Okay. Because we're only at the synthetic ground section of, of our, our understanding. Stuart, what are you hearing? Nothing. No, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking of the road runner. The road runner. Yeah, the, when, when he runs off the cliff. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's something of that in it. I mean, it sounds flippant. There's something about the, the looking at this, the more and more, makes it seem even more that if you just keep going, somehow you keep going. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes you know, sense, but that is not what, I mean, as much as I love the robot, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, no. No, I'm not saying that's what this is, but oh, I'm okay. saying that, that's what my, there's a, there's a sort of, there's kind of a feeling that sort of, like works, sort of, Kind of having this as a background, but without knowing. Does that, does that make sense? By sort of prodding at it too much. Kind of, See, uh, you will never know until you finish your PhD, your PhD, your PhD thesis, really what your research question is. In fact, a lot of times you don't really know what it is until many years later. When, like Chris was saying, I don't even know why I picked out these pictures, but now I just look at them and I go, oh, I see. I see what the thing is, I see what the journey's been. On the other hand, still on your PhD thesis, despite this little problem, you still have to say, I have a research question and here's what it is. And you can change it, you can mount, you can like mold it, you can you know, flip it around and stuff like this. But in the end of the day, in order to prove that it is true, you have to have a ground. For Kant, the ground is going to be this transcendental move. For Foucault, the ground is going to be this parisic relationship between bodies, which we'll get into in a minute. For Wittgenstein, the ground, and, and in fact, I would go as far as say for all three that I just mentioned, the ground will be the judgments. That what forms your system of knowing is the way in which judgments emerge. And that is what I, I'm trying to give you as an opening gambit so you, we can walk into this critique. So you know the sort of the general scope of what's happening here. Do you have, what, you have to speak. <laughs> no, no, really. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about it. 
See, and here's the, the problem. Yeah. Can you think without identifying? Because I think you can. There's no, there's no wrong with not knowing what a ground is. As in not knowing a ground, but without being able to articulate it. Okay, I'm going to try it just slightly differently. But that's okay. I mean, how does just look that at that table. But I, the syn so See, this is where the fourth finger comes in and looks. Huh? How does this? How does it synthesize? I mean, if if that's the grounds that stops the salt from going any further, <coughs> um, how would how would Kant uh, see that in synthetic terms? What what? So presumably, because it's because it stopped the salt, there are disparate elements that are combining, synthesizing to create a meta level, and the meta level is is, is, the, is preventing the salt yeah. going down. But what are the disparate elements that are that are combining? Anybody in the case of the table, rephrase that. <clears throat> yeah, Ed. I mean, I'm I'm um, confused by. Uh, I'm not going to answer directly, but I'm, I'm going to ask a question which relates to it. I think, which is, um, I'm not sure. I I, I, I haven't been familiar with um, uh, uh, kind of having a synthetic a priori. Because if you're, if you're you saying, if you would know, if you're saying, if, you're, yeah, if the idea of a synthetic is it's an admixture, so it's, it's an entity, but it's something which is divisible. But it's an a priori. So, um, at what point do those? If it can be broken down into four, into earlier parts, how can you have um, an a priori that is? Um, uh, yeah, how, I don't see how that actually operates. How can That's you have right? How can you have an a priori? Uh, so how can this? So how does it, you know, how does this table come into being? There's a synthetic a priori. Would that be the synthesis? Not quite. So, so if, it's, yes. yeah, if it's a surface and legs, and they've been, and then the formation, the synthesis of the those two has provided <coughs> a an elevated hard platform, then um, right, exactly. How is that a priori? I mean, you could say you, know, you could say uh, <coughs> that the salt brings the table into being. You know, the, the salt and, uh, finds its ground, and it becomes a ground because of the salt. It doesn't it, go any further. Yeah. If there was no salt, in a sense, it wouldn't be a ground. There wouldn't be anything to uh, against which to give it relief. Yeah, but I was looking at one ground because you see that the salt finds its ground, a pen finds its other ground. You know, the, there is no one ground, and yet there is one ground because the ground will stop. Let's call it controlling something around the, 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 the things stop because of the ground, but they will stop at a different place for them, would they? Depends on what ground they need to be to prove their existence. Okay. Dane, wait, oh, you have spoken. Sorry. <laughs> Dane? Um, I'm coming out with some left angle. Um, okay. Kierkegaard talks about anxiety as an ontology, because it doesn't have, it doesn't have an object to which it moves towards teleologically and it, he talked about how anxiety is a, the very possibility of being it's, and how it lifts one up from the ground but at the same time anxiety still provides a different sort of ground within which possibility freedom etc emerges and has its own ways of doing things different ways of doing things that, doesn't, that isn't directed by the ground, that's a teleological. Okay, good. Okay, excellent. Now you may speak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe that what they just said it is uh, it's, it's fundamental because the problem that uh, Kant starts uh, answering is precisely shifting from the teleological. Which the pedagogical judgment, the purposiveness to something entirely different that is not even uh, perpendicular to it. I would say it's almost incommensurable, which is uh, testing and judging for, for lawfulness. This is the expression that is used in the Testing and judging for lawfulness. Yeah, for its lawfulness. It's, it's, it's a expression that is used in the introduction to mm -hmm. the critical judgment. That is, we are not judging these or that, but the, the, what comes into focus is possibility 
versus the generation, versus the Termin instances. This is the way I start to understand it. So, the, what, as in the critique of pure reason, is how knowledge is possible, not what is known, or what is supposed to be known. Here is the structure and the dynamic of judgment become the, the principle which we are called the ground, on which everything else can be then built, from which everything else can be derived. So, the, 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 and in particular, and this is why it becomes so interesting reading um, his argument, for instance, for us, is that he divides two kinds of judgment. One is theological, deterministic, almost very practical, and it seems from the language he holds it in less regard. And then one is aesthetic judgment, which more than once is stated by the kind that it belongs to theoretical philosophy. Yeah. It is what completes theoretical philosophy. So, so let's just, I want to make sure everybody can get here. Okay, so how many people are not sure of the word teleological? Okay, we have a few, good, some people admitted. Excellent, okay. Here we go with telos, just for a second. There's a lot of excellent. Okay, we have here, the telos means, telos, spelled T-E-L-O-S, telos, and teleological is T-E-L-O, logical, so the logic of the telos means that the view is, unless you are a complete robot, you will know that entities are born, they live, and they die. That's more or less the trajectory. And that is how change is often understood. A little, let's say a baby is born, it then grows, and then it dies. And so your whole logic is based on that notion. And the ground of that view is that you start here, you get here, you get here, you get here, you get here, and then you die. Now, the telos, the way it works is using the famous example of the acorn, is that an acorn, which is a seed, you plant it in the ground and it begins to unfold. And as it unfolds, it grows and becomes a tree. So the trajectory of this telos, of this telos, is this unfolding, changing thing that becomes the tree. And we know that the purpose of that acorn I mean, it might have a lot of other purposes. It might be the purpose to feed animals. It might be the purpose, I don't know what, for something else. It's a good dinner. But the basic purpose from the point of view of the acorn is that it becomes a tree, that it becomes an oak tree. And the oak tree, from the point of view of the acorn, is its purpose. So the notion of the oak tree comes back to become the reason that the seed starts to unfold. So the oak tree becomes the ground that pushes the, tr the seed to grow. Is it, is it not, I, unfortunately I was thinking about this the other, uh, the other week, yeah. Um, I know, I need to upgrade my Sky subscription. Um, <laughs> is, is that not employing a circular logic, that the only reason that you can determine <coughs> the, the telos of the acorn is because you've, you, you've seen it as an oak tree. I mean, what if, what if it's a squirrel's point of view, where the acorn is wasted if it falls into the ground and sprouts, and in fact We're not looking at it from the squirrel's point of view. Oh, well, why not? Great, because why not? we're only looking at it from the point of view of the object itself. To, I'm not saying, look, we're critiquing Talos, but mm. just so you know what the Talos is about, mm. it is, so you're all PhD students. Well, let's just say you're all PhD students for the sake of the argument. You're going for your PhD, that's your goal. The PhD as your goal comes back around and informs your way of being for the next three years, for the next four years, the next however many years. So you go on your path, da, 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 I'm a PhD student, and eventually I'm going to get my PhD. And that whole thing about getting your PhD is becoming your reality. Well, the same point of view of the, the acorn. The acorn, hello, 
Sorry. This one, the acorn becomes the tree. And its change is determined by God, by its DNA, by something like that. And the acorn will never become a sports car. The acorn can only become the oak tree. And that's its, that's its start, that's its journey, and that's its goal, and it comes, and the goal comes back around and gives it its meaning. And that's, and so it's not, it's not tautological, it's teleological, because there's a change that comes in. Right. So it's not the tauto, it's the telos. Would okay. it also be correct to say that it implies an economy, as in uh, everything that the one does is in function of the telos? Yes. Yes. So then all, all representational logic falls into this, into this group. And every one of us in this room agrees with the telos on some level. A little girl is born and she is given pink blanket and, is, and, and un, until she dies her, her role is mapped out in the family. And until, until there was like various forms of feminism, that's how it was. You just that you know you could be angry, you could be happy. It doesn't matter. You you would unfold and become, I don't know, a mother who would come back around and form the rest of the, you know get everybody else to off to lunch, off to off to work. Now, if you decided that that wasn't a good idea, then you were insane, or you were immoral, or you were wrong. You have lots of problems, but the one problem wasn't that you should be able to think outside this path. So the tello <coughs> is a very old form of thinking. It's a very rigorous form on some level, and it still is with us today. Uh, there are a lot of people who have families, I'm sure everybody in this room is, is involved with it, who flip out if you tell them you're doing something that isn't in the kind of general program of what the family should be doing, or what the family thinks you should be doing. I know in the Jewish families, often a child is born and they're already handing out their dentist card, you know, because they'll either become a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist, that's or sometimes a businessman. So those are the cards that get handed out. And that's the old joke with the Jewish family. You know, and then, you know, and then as you grow up, the mother is always going, the, the stereotypic mother is always weeping and crying, you know, why have you done this to me? All right, this is the argument, you know, well, you're not actually in the picture, but... It's the same thing, it's a telos. And the telos operates, and it's very important, and it still operates, and still operates logically in all of your work. Going somewhere, but the question that Kant asks is, isn't there a way to think that, that will allow that little acorn, or that little girl, or that little slave, to come to be something else that's not prescribed in the, in the path? And in order to get to the answer of yes, and just say it's something other than just, you know, who gets to win in a war, who gets to fight, he opts for this notion of the aesthetic as a form of judgment. And that's where we're trying to get to today. We're trying to get to open the book. Yes. I was going to say, in terms of the telos, is that, uh, is the always already another uh, reframing of the telos? No. The telos has three parts to it. It has the beginning, it has the process, and it has the goal. And the goal comes back around and forms the ground. And this famous thing called back around and forms the ground, you need to understand this as well as you can because that's the notion of the transcendental. That's the notion of movement in a logical concept. If you don't have movement in your concept, if you don't have movement in your method, you're just going to do description. You're not going to be, a if you can't figure out how the concept operates, you're simply going to be describing something. Now, that's not such a tragedy. A lot of good science is based on description. But it's a tragedy for art. It's a tragedy for knowledge in certain senses. So Kant is presenting kind of like a sophisticated attack, but at the same time he's still using the telos in his work. As we'll find out, or maybe as some of you already know, with Hegel, 
you know, he basically, what, what Kant does is he comes up with two different ways in which you can combine this, and, and Hegel says, no, there's only one system. And he has a whole different way of combining it. Any questions so far? I get the sense that this is, you're having your dialectics. No, no, it's not dialectics. Yeah, Hegel's I like, yeah. No. So the question I want to know is, can we open the book? Can we look at this? Um, I, I'm not sure what you're hearing. I really am not sure because you're being very, very quiet. I was a little bit worried about the idea of, of the, like Barnaby saying that the table is pre pre preventing the salt going down because if it's the ground, there's no down for it to go. There's no down for it to go. So it's not preventing it, it's just there isn't anywhere for it to go. Right. That is it. That is it. Yeah. That's right. And that's what Kant is trying to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. I, was just, I was just trying to, I understand that is it, but I was trying to, I was wondering how that, uh, I was confused, I think, in the same way, that the difference between the synthesis and the a priori, I mean, if you said there's nowhere to go, it's it's a flat surface, and it's it, it exists, it's there, it's a priori, but I, I, what I didn't understand was the synthesis implies that there's been some movement, some dynamism. Um, yeah. To, to create the service. So I didn't really understand how those well, I sort of really understand how those two can can work simultaneously. I think that we're gonna try and do that because what Kant is gonna do is develop the, the discussion between time and space. And that's gonna come into how that is developed. Now um, I shall we so what would you like to start with? Where are you on? What page are you on? Uh, I just opened the random is the section five of the introduction to the second edition. Okay. Uh, so the synthetic a priori judgments are contained as principles in all theoretical science. That one? Principle of formal, well, probably, I just opened that random. It's just not. It's no, no, page 68 in the. Uh, yeah. And by the way, do you notice it says critique of power, the critique of the power of judgment? as opposed to, it often says the critique of judgment, so that's another little addition to the approach. So you're on page what page again? It's 68, but the book opened by itself. <laughs> um, I found it quite useful, the, uh, perhaps it's skipping ahead a bit, but the presentation of the antinomy of taste, okay. um, which I found quite... Um, what does the word antinomy, antinomy mean? Uh, the... the it's, it's a contradiction without speaking against something. The okay, so opposite, if you want to It's an antagonism. Yeah, an antagonism, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, simply because it, 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 it introduces the idea of indeterminacy. And, right. And, and effectively, it kind of completes a sort of equation. Obviously, unlike Matera, you know, I read all the preceding pages. So <laughs> just, just happened to find that. Yeah, just, I realise that's not probably what we're asked to uh, read. So. No, no. But it, nevertheless, it was, it was quite... In terms of how the how he was structuring things, I found it quite interesting. Um, um, illuminating. Who would like to begin? Because I'm very happy to begin wherever we're going to begin, but I don't want to be the one that actually leads unless we have to. Did anybody? What did you read for today? What did what what did you want to land on today? Then we can sort of. Profit premise. Okay, what page? 55. 55. In there, which I... Okay, well, let's start with that. But you can start down. 55. And Cambridge. this is which edition? Uh, Cambridge. Okay. Do th these numbers on the side, I mean, they're not page numbers. Right. Um, numbers. Yeah, so I'm just thinking these reference numbers that we can all they, use. Yeah, they're reference numbers, that they're sections. And that if you look at the very beginning when they do the translation, you'll see how they. <coughs> so should we just should we yeah, just use the same those? for all translation yeah. those numbers? Yeah, 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 so that, we yeah, just yeah, yeah, use yeah. Those instead of page numbers. Yeah, so yeah, five column one six seven is the beginning of the preface, no matter where you can reach it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay. Wikipedia. Go for it, Dean. Um, okay. Very long the faculty of cognition from a priori principles can be called pure reason, and the investigation of its possibility and boundaries in general can be called the critique of pure reason. Okay, let's stop right there. What are you reading? What is it saying to you? What is a faculty? It's a capacity. And the word cognition here is translation of provisions as knowledge, but I think the word cognition features the, the, the changing of the, 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 the dynamism of the faculty as, as it's processing, as it's doing, it's not just acquiring this thing called knowledge, it's actually. Right, so cognition is not. Doing yeah, something. yeah, so recognize means recognizing. It doesn't mean that you just so, oh yeah, I know who you are. Right, okay. So cognition is, has to do with the faculty of thinking. Okay. And it says, <clears throat> this thing called the cognition comes from a priori principles. Which mean what? What, are, what is an a priori principle? It's a principle which is before experience. Right, okay. It but it doesn't mean that it's essentially metaphysical. It's not an eternal thing, but it's something that's conditions, principles, that, that they arise out of. Right. And what's a good example of something that conditions the principle of knowledge? It starts with a D. It with a T. Don't. Yes, thank you. All right. So the faculty of cognition, so go on, can be called pure reason. And the investigation of this possibility and possibility of boundaries in general can be called the critique of pure reason. So you can get the idea of what a critique is here. It's what what are the boundaries of knowing, of judging, um, This faculty only reason in its theoretical use is understood, as was also the case in the first work under this title, Critique of Pure Reason, um, without bringing into the investigation its capacity as practical reason in accordance with its special principles. So, reason not regulates, but it's it's the, dom the reason is the domain, I think he calls it the territory at some point, within which theoretical what's it called? reason in its theoretical use mm -hmm. comes, is, is carried out. And what does it mean to say theoretical use? What does the theoria mean? Hmm. Um. Our man in charge of Greek? Well, theory is a list of things originally, but I don't believe we can use... No, no, no list. No, in, in, the, in the way in which the Socratic use of theory... It's not practice, it's only theory. Theory it means sensuousness. Sadly, we see what's happening to little theory. Mm -hmm. no. um, okay, go on. That's distinct from knowledge. That's, that's the faculty of understanding, which is the more empirical domain. Right, and so the empirical he's going to attack. Hmm. Okay, just so keep continue. Okay, so but what is it about this preface that you thought that that, that was? Can you summarize what you thought was the issue here? Um, it was like well, it was situating the domain in which what is the limit of knowledge? You know, where where does it stop? Well, how far can it go before it it's a sort of stop? And again, the same with reason and a game of judgment. And then he goes on to deal with principles of dealing with the beautiful. What's his an answer? How far can it go before it can't go any further? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, can you pass me the water? Halu, can you pour out a little bit of water without getting it on anybody's stuff? Can you see that water? Do you mind if we use some of your water? Can you just pour out a little bit of the water? It could be the limits of the language or the way you can think. You open that up and pour on the table a little bit of the water. Yeah, on the table so people can see it. Pour out the water. No, no, not on your cup. Pour it literally on the table. Okay, great. Now, where's the edge of that water? Where does the edge of the water take you? Where's the boundary of that? Looking at the water, where is the edge? Jin, where's the edge there? This is not a trick question. Where is the edge? Lily, you want to point at the edge? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I can see why the Kantian thing is very difficult at the moment. You're not seeing the edge of that water. It has a defined edge, and where is it? Can you point to it? Yes, it's Okay, can you, Dan, can you point to the edge of that so that, can you point to the edge? When the water's going, where does it stop? It stops. It stops in that little area where it is. Now, if you kind of mess the water up a little bit, can you do that? Now where does it stop? It stops where, where it stops. Yeah. But it still has a shape. And it still has an edge. Mm. If you do it again, now where's the edge? It's, it's all over the place, yep. but it still has an edge. The edge is as far as it is. That's what the edge is. If you said that the edge was just a concept, you wouldn't get there. It doesn't, that water doesn't go beyond its own edge. But the edge is in any, any type of shape. So if you think about how this is working with a, a boundary, don't think of a boundary as this sort of cut, this deep cut around which something can possibly jump over it. The water can't jump over itself. It just is itself. It is its boundary. So in that sense, pure reason knows the possibility of what it knows, but it doesn't. In a sense, it doesn't know itself. Beyond. Like, it yeah, exactly. It yeah. doesn't know beyond itself. Yes. And what we're heading okay. to is is what other what other ways can we know? Yes. Without being in that mode of knowing. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Good. But I feel like there's about eight of you that are going. I don't know why I'm here. I'm sure there's a good reason on some level. It will possibly become clearer. <coughs> Is it becoming clearer? No. Okay, go on, Jane. Um. Um, um, thus the critique which looks to the faculties of cognition as a whole, concerned with the contribution that each of the other faculties might profess to make, to the bare possession of cognition of its own source, is left with nothing but what the understanding prescribes a priori, priori as law for nature, as the sum of appearances, whose form is likewise given a priori. So, so what does that mean? Well, it's the understanding knows. It has its end, it, it has a subject of only to what it can no. Yes. And that, why is the boundary important? This is why we're talking about Talos to start with. Well, it goes on to okay. make a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, go on. Just remember, ask yourself the question, why is the boundary important? Like, what's going on with this boundary? What's he doing to this boundary? We know a boundary is important because it gives a marker. And once you have a marker, you can make sort of sense that you can play against it. If you were just swimming in the ocean, just sort of floating, it, it would be very difficult. But once you have a boundary, once you have a deep cut, you can make positions out of it. And he's criticizing that. He's criticizing that way of thinking. That's a very typical way of thinking. Yes, no, right, wrong, good, bad. These create a boundary around which one operates. And he's saying, you've got to throw that out if you really want to understand your research. 
Um, a bit further down the next page, he says, it's back to different understanding, has thereby also con confined the possibility of all things in general. Wait, 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 I can't find it. Is it 